of you that are fasting already know it hasn't been easy, right? It hasn't been easy. And <clears throat> the mind of Christ as the pastor has been praying. That's been my prayer all week. As the elimination of food has not necessarily been a problem or an issue in my house. It's been the attacks of the enemy in the spiritual realm on our minds and even our emotions. Right, so I guess that everyone else is going through that also. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're just going to continue our series in James. We're on James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, we'll be covering today. Thank God a lot of people got prayed for before this message. We'll see why. <laughs> this is one of those messages that. <laughs> Uh, but it's the word of God, it's the truth, right? <clears throat> all right, amen. When you're there, just say amen and we'll begin. Amen. All right, all right. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on, earth, on the earth in luxury and in <laughs> self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Those are some strong words. Point number one. Well, if you haven't got it by now, this is about wealth. Wealth can be a dangerous trap when hoarded. And I'm going to touch on that. They were hoarding their wealth. They were hoarding everything they had and depriving these people of everything that was rightfully theirs. Why did James say this to them? Because he saw what was going on. He saw them hoarding their wealth and holding back. And because of what they were doing, he said they were going to face miseries. So that they should start weeping and howling now for what was coming ahead. So in other words, you better start crying now for what you're about to face. Because it's going to get real. The miseries that James were referring to were the miseries that come with replacing God with wealth. And material, you could also throw in there. And when we think that wealth can give us something that the Lord can't, Miseries will begin to consume our hearts, minds, and our lives. These miseries that he was trying to highlight so that, so that they can uh, become aware to and prepare for was loneliness, emptiness, purposelessness, all kinds of insecurities. Remember, when somebody relies on their money, that money is their security. That money is their everything. So if they have money, they think in their, in their eyes, they have it all. Their minds were going to be consumed with these things. James was trying to uh, uh, highlight to, to, in their lives so that they can, of course, repent. The Bible does not teach that money is evil or money in and of itself is bad or evil. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, it is the love of money that is the root to all kinds of evil. That means many different evil things. And it can be extremely dangerous when it falls into the hands of those who are prone to use it for the wrong purposes, which here is for themselves. In these six verses, James is addressing the non-believers, the rich, right? But there are believers that are present. So he's addressing the, the people, they're non-believing rich folks, but 
the believers are present. He wants the believer to hear what he's saying to them. When we rely on our money and our resources and what we can do, what we're really saying through our actions is that we do not need God. That's right. That's Why? Because in our own thought process, we got this. I can afford it. I got the money. I can do this. We're going to get through this. We're going to make it. Everything's going to be all right. The numbers are good in the bank. We're good. We have property. We have clothes. We have everything we need. We're all right. I'll serve God when, you know, later down the line. I'm not ready right now. I'll serve him when, you know, I get a little better. Or I get a little more money. Right? I'll start tithing after I make that deal. But the truth of the matter is, if you're not a giver now, with the little, you're not going to be a giver with the much. And it becomes even harder to trust God when you rely on other things. Mm -hmm. When you rely on money, when you rely on your natural talents and abilities to gain that wealth. That's right. Because in our minds, again, we got this. We're good. Jesus said in Luke 16, 9, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Amen. Listen to this. Then when your earthly possessions are gone... They will welcome you to an eternal home. That means that we are to make wise decisions with, with our finances and every financial opportunity that presents itself to us. We're to use, we, we are to use what we have for the benefit as believers for the kingdom of God and to bring people to Christ. If we use what we have to meet the needs of the people and lead them to Christ, our earthly investments will bring eternal benefits. Make sense? We can't let our representation, church, of Christ be tainted when it comes to using what God has blessed us with for his kingdom. God calls us to be honest, even in the small details of life that are usually ignored or passed by. Every small detail requires us to be honest. We're accountable to the Lord. Luke 16, 11 says, if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Heaven's riches are far more valuable than all the wealth that can be accumulated here on earth. And if we're not trustworthy with our money, little, a lot, it doesn't matter. We will be unfit, the scripture says, to handle the great riches of the kingdom of God. We have to maintain our integrity in all matters of life, especially like here in our, with our wealth. And many of us may not be wealthy, but you're still accountable to God for what you do have, whether it be a little or whether it be a lot. You're accountable to God for every penny that goes to, through your hands. Every penny that's deposited in your bank account, every withdrawal, and every deposit, we are accountable to God for. We have to understand that. When, we, when you combine wealth with a greedy, selfish heart, it can easily consume and corrupt a person's life. It, it, it destroys homes. It destroys lives. Because our total reliance is on our gain, on our wealth. And you, we become blinded to what matters most in life, like these people were. Many have rejected salvation even because of wealth. Many people... In their eyes, their wealth is everything. And in here, the rich, can't, they couldn't understand how I have to leave everything for the Lord. They couldn't understand the righteous words that James was speaking. They couldn't fathom. They couldn't grab a hold of it. Because in their mind, they got it. They're good. What they had was enough. James doesn't know what he's talking about. We're good. We're good. We're going to keep 
killing, destroying, robbing people, and gaining wealth. We're going to keep holding back their wages and just not give them what is rightfully theirs. Let them lose what they have. It doesn't matter. Let them get locked up and their family starve to death because that was that's what was happening. They, they were starving to death, them and their families. They were even thrown in prison. Matthew 19, 16 says, what do I have to do... What do I have to do to have eternal life? Mm -hmm. Now, remember, this, this was the rich man. This was the rich man that he came to Jesus <laughs> and he said, Listen, I kept all the commandments. I did everything I had to do. Just tell me what I have to do. Please tell me. Tell me anything and I'll do it. Yeah. He made it come across like he was willing to do anything. Yeah. Right? But little did he know the response that was going to shake his world. Jesus said to him in, uh, in verse 21, Matthew 19, verse 21, but drop, I was on 16, now I dropped to verse 21. Go and sell all your possessions. Give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Wow, that's powerful. That's powerful. Now, it almost seems, if you don't study the word, it almost seems as if God doesn't want people to have money. But that's not the case. The case with this man was that his heart was so in love with his wealth. He rely, his reliance on his wealth was everything. His money was everything. His possessions were everything. So verse 22 states that he left sad because he had many possessions. He relied on his wealth. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 19, the same chapter, verses 23 through 26, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples here were astonished and said, Then who can be saved? Jesus replied, With people, this is impossible. But with God... All things are possible. Amen. In other words, it takes nothing less for the, but, but the power of God to save us from the dangers of greed and selfishness that are bound up in wealth. Wealth is a dangerous trap, especially when it's taken the place of God in our lives. Amen. To be rich without God is to be blinded of the light of Christ and eternity. James was pointing out that wealth is temporary, and the judgment and, etern and, and, and eternity is what lies ahead. And everyone is accountable to God for what they are doing or what they have done with their wealth, and in our case, with our money. Right? We're accountable, church, for every penny, every single penny. I, I keep saying that because I want you to get that. Every penny we're accountable for. And to pursue wealth to the neglect of pursuing God or to trust in wealth as the solution to their needs or to our needs is straight foolishness. Amen. A fool does that. I say that because that's what scripture says. A fool will do that. There were three main indicators of wealth at the time that James wrote this letter. First, there was grain. If you had an abundance of grain, you were considered wealthy. And they stored this grain in large silos, which were like holes in the ground, similar to a storage room, right? So when James said in verse 2 that your riches have rotted, he was referring to the grain in these silos, which were have rotting away because they had so much of it. They were in, They had so much, that, and I'm sure they were still eating, but it was so much that they, would, they never had a chance to get to it. So it was rotting away. Second was clothing. He says, your garments are moth-eaten. The poor only had one outfit. They only had what was on their backs. It's not like today we have, I know today we need to change of clothes. But they only had one outfit. 
Okay, it's not like they can go home and change and throw something else on and the next day throw another outfit on. They had one outfit, one garment. One garment. They couldn't change their clothes every day like us. This was a sign of wealth. To have more than one change of clothes. James was trying to point out that to have all of these things, abundance of grain and more clothes that you ever needed, you don't need that many, those, that many outfits because the moths are going to eat them anyway by the time you get to wear them. Third, there were gold and silver. The first part of verse 3 says, your gold and silver have corroded. Now James knew, and I hope that everyone here knows, that gold and silver cannot corrode. What happens to them, they tarnish. They cannot corrode. James knew that these metals were not subject to corrosion or rust. He was just trying to point out that when God brings judgment upon them, even these precious metals were doomed to corruption. Second, the second part of verse 3 says, their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. The meaning behind this statement is the wealth will eat at your flesh like fire, like a fire. Meaning, if they kept hoarding wealth, the wealth that they were hoarding, their passion to hoard more and more wealth will burn within them. The more you have, the more you want. The more and more and more and more, it keeps going, it keeps going. And it eats at you. So the more we hoard, the more we will desire and lust to hoard more. The lust to hoard more than needed will burn within them, he was saying, and consume them. And they will never, ever be satisfied or fulfilled in their life. And the same applies to us. We will never, ever be satisfied or fulfilled in our life. The more we want. It goes with everything. Everything. Wealth, property, clothes, shoes, purses, whatever the case may be. It, it, we can apply that to a lot of areas in our lives. Almost every area. The fire of passion and lust for wealth will destroy them here on earth and for eternity. It's what he's saying. If they do not acknowledge God and repent, it will eat their flesh and become a consuming fire and passion of their life. It will burn and consume them. And it will consume us. What did Judas say to the chief priest? In Matthew 26, 15. He, he said, what will you give me if I deliver Jesus to you? What will you give me if I deliver Jesus to you? What was he after? He was seeking wealth. Remember, they paid him 30 pieces of silver. Who was Judas? Remember who he was. He was a treasurer. And he was always dipping his hand in the money bag. He was always taking money out of the money bag. You see, God ain't nothing new under the sun. God knows everything. God knows it all. God knows everything. And Judas was consumed. But where did that lust and passion for wealth lead him. Where did he end up? What did he end up doing before he ended up there? You see, Matthew 27, 5 says he threw the pieces of silver back at them. And he wanted to hurt himself. The fire of passion and lust for wealth that burned within him led to his destruction and eternal damnation. He had to pay the consequence of his decision. For lust and after wealth. How? By spending eternity in hell. 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. That's exactly what happened to Judas. You see, the church, the word of God is so true. Amen. It's vital that we, you base your life upon this word. Amen. Not on circumstances, not on gain, not on wealth, not on anything, not even on your job. Amen. 
The, the word of God has to be the foundation Amen. of everything in your life. Amen. Without a solid foundation, nothing will stand. Mm -hmm. Right? We don't want to be like the fool who built his house on sinking sand. Amen. Right? right? We want to build our house on the rock of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? The author and finisher of our faith. The rock that is not movable, unshakable. Right? Amen. Amen. The last part of verse 3 says, you have laid up treasure in the last days. This is in, re this is in reference to the coming judgment when all men shall stand before God, you know, God Almighty, and give an account Amen. for everything that they have done and that have, we have done. Mm -hmm. In other words, they've been sowing into their own lives and pockets, right, and bank accounts for so long without repenting and acknowledging God. Mm -hmm. So now you should start weeping and howling, like he said, right, in verse 1, and be prepared to weep the consequences of your actions, right, right and expect all kinds of miseries mm -hmm. to come upon you. That they have brought upon themselves. And a lot of times we can apply that too, right? How many issues have we brought upon ourselves? And we want God to take us out of. How about we just go back to the basics? Living our life by and through and stand by standing on the word of God. And before making a decision, consult in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says... He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is vanity. And it's the truth. People that make money, they're not satisfied. That's why they go from job to job, company to company, because they want more. They think too highly of themselves. They want more and more and more and more. Just like Jesus' parable of the rich fool in Luke 12. Mm -hmm. He had plenty stored up for his life, right? Yeah. What did God say? You fool. Yeah. I love the word. <laughs> so if you call somebody a fool, just say, listen, the Lord said it. <laughs> God is good. He said, you fool. This night your soul is required of you. Why? Because your wealth and accumulations mean nothing without me. In other words, God was saying, everything that you have gained or accumulated in your life or for yourself, without me, he was saying, it means nothing and it's all for nothing. And like he said, this night your soul will be required of you. So when he died, what happened? He didn't take nothing with him. All that Stress to go after and get more and more and more. Cutting throats and stepping over people and for nothing. But now you're dead. Mm -hmm. And then spending eternity in hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He had earthly riches, but where it mattered the most, he was poor. That's right. That's right. Many people don't understand or realize that. You can have wealth, accumulations, property, those are all good things. They are. Mm -hmm. But without the Lord, it's for nothing. That's right. Amen. Where it mattered the most was in the Lord. Luke 12, 21 says, a person is a fool. Again, I don't know, God's talking to somebody, huh? <laughs> a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Wealth can be a dangerous trap that leads people to eternal destruction. Why? Because it blinds you of the truth. It blinds you of your destiny. God, you are destined, church, saints, believers, to spend eternity with God in heaven. Sometimes wealth traps us. And the, the thought of more and wanting more, we work so hard for more and more and more and more. If I just had this, I can do that. If I get there, I can do this. How about let's go back, draw it back, take a step back and say, wait, with God, I can get that. With God, I can do this. Amen? Amen. 
If it's the will of God for you to have it, you will get it. But if we place our trust in him first and him alone, believe me, all things that are needed for you, all things that you need in this life will be given to you. He is a provider of our needs. Amen. He will not let us go hungry. He will not leave us without. He is a provider, an ever-present help in our time of need. Point number two. Wealth can lead to fraud, self-indulgence, and murder. Wealth can lead to fraud, self-indulgence, and murder. Verses 4 through 6 say, I know I read them, but I'm going to read them again. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Wow. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. These wealthy landowners were cheating their laborers out of their hard-earned wages. This issue was so common that God's law spoke against holding a worker's wages. There are many scriptures that touch on this, but I'm just going to give uh, one. Leviticus 19.13 says, You shall not oppress your neighbor, nor shall you rob him. The wages of a hired help, of a hired man, are not to remain with you all night until morning. If you got it, they earn their wages, you give it to them. Don't let them wait till morning, they need it. These laborers, they survive on their daily wages. That's how they did everything. That's how they paid their taxes. That's how they ate, fed their families. So to withhold their day's, their day's pay was wrong, and it was considered fraud. They were robbing these workers and their families of their daily meals. Most of us, again, are not in the position of paying wages to workers. But the principles still apply. Mm -hmm. And if you are, you should be generous and fair and just. Their love of money led them to do these things to these, pe these poor people. Their love of money led them to cheat, to steal, mm -hmm. and commit fraud. They felt as if they can oppress their workers by withholding their wages. Malachi 3, 5 says, I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, and those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages. And do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Deuteronomy 24, 14 15, to 15 says, You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, Amen. whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, so that he will not cry against you to the Lord. And become sin to you. Amen, amen. The cries of these workers that were not given what they had rightfully worked for and earned had reached the ears of the Lord now. Amen, amen. That's why James is here. These cries reached the Lord. Some say that with wealth comes power, right? Mm -hmm. Why is it that some people that are wealthy, that gain a little bit of power, feel they can do what they want, mm -hmm. right? when they want, treat people however they feel is right in their own eyes, mm -hmm. right? And they think that just because they have money and a little power, they can rule and just walk over everyone. Mm -hmm. Throughout histi history, corrupt dictators have gained power and wealth for themselves and their families, mm -hmm. right? 
And I've made decisions that have mainly benefited them and their families and their pockets to increase their property and finances. Right? But even with all their money and power, they still have to face judgment. Amen. You see, thank God for his word. Amen. James says, they lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence and have fattened their hearts in a day of slaughter. Now, self-indulgence is not only the accumulation of wealth and material. Self-indulgence is when we rely on wealth to meet our needs. And we visualize wealth as the only source and protection in our lives. In other words, it takes the place of God. It takes God off the throne and those things that you rely on, whether it be accumulation of property, finance, money, whatever, replaces it with that. And that's a dangerous place to be. Mm -hmm. This was a warning from God to the ones that were hoarding more than what they needed. They were committing fraud and self-indulgent and even committing murder. Many of these people who were robbed of their wages could not pay off their debts or their taxes. They were forced to sell their land and their possessions. And then what happens next? They're thrown into prison. Even while you're in prison, you're responsible for paying your taxes, your debts, if they still own property. But if they sold it off, they didn't have to pay the, the, the taxes, but they still had to pay their debts, regardless of being in prison or not. And many of their them and their families ended up dying of starvation. That's what happened here. And God considered God, God considered what they did to these people as being murder. So God looked at them as murderers. These wealthy people were taking everything from these people, sucking them dry, literally, to their last breath. All they were doing was adding more and more weight of sin. For the day of slaughter. When James said this, he was referring to the wrath of God's judgment. Mm. Just like barn animals that, were be, that used to be prepared for sacrifice. What they did with these animals, they would set them apart from the other animals and get them nice and fat. Right? You get the animal nice and fat, there's more meat to go around. So these animals were set apart from... The, the herd, usually, and fattened up. So that's why he's saying this here. Nice and fat for the day of slaughter. <laughs> These people's hearts were set only on wealth and gain. Matthew 6, 21 says, Where your treasure is, your heart is also, right? Their treasure was in worldly wealth. So their hearts were consumed with getting more and more and more and more wealth. Regardless who or stood in their way. Church, I know this is not a, a popular topic or subject or scriptures, but these scriptures are so vital. Amen. When we break down these God's word and we begin to study and learn, you, your eyes are just open. Right. Amen. The word just pierces your heart. Mm -hmm. Your eyes are open. Amen. Let this word run through your mind richly. Mm -hmm. Let it run through your spirit richly. Amen. Amen. Receive this word because even though you may not be a person in position of wealth or, or property or workers, the principle still applies. The little bit that we have, we're accountable to God for. Mm -hmm. Amen? What we do have, we're responsible and accountable to God Almighty for. And for those of us that misuse our wealth and our finances, that's a dangerous place. Because if you can't be relied on in the little things, if, you, if God can't count on you just to use wisdom with a little bit, he gives you. How can we expect to give us more? Right? How can we expect more? Sometimes we expect to be delivered out of a situation, but the one that we're currently in, we can't handle. Because we're not going back to the root. We're not going back to the word. Right? Sometimes we want to get delivered financially out of our circumstance or situation, but the little bit that we have, we're misusing. But we want God to give us more and bless us financially. But the little bit that we get every week, we're not using it correctly to benefit the spreading of the gospel, right, and the kingdom of God. No, we use it for self-gain. 
myself included. We use it for self-gain, for more and more and more and more. But how can we ask God to deliver us from something financially when the little bit we have that he has given us? Because remember, God has given us the power to gain wealth. Amen. Deuteronomy, I believe it's 18, says that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He has given us the power to gain wealth. So it is because of him we have Amen. what we have in the first place. Amen. So how can we not give back a portion of what is rightfully his? Amen. Right? Yeah. Doesn't make sense. Right. And he only requires a 10%. And I know this is not on tithing, but it falls in the lines of finances mm -hmm. and wealth, right? Or open our homes or give people a meal or bless somebody. We have to use what we have for the kingdom of God and to spread the gospel. And a lot of times if you're in a position of wealth and your property, whatever the case may be, even if you're not be, we are accountable and responsible for using what we have for the Lord. It's his anyway. Amen. Right? These people were using their wealth in an ungodly manner. Romans 2, chapter 2, verses 5 through 6 says, Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Amen. He will render to each one according to to his works. Mm -hmm. You gotta reap what you sow. That's right. In other words, since the misuse of wealth, church will bring a person into bring a person into judgment mm -hmm. that will make him weep and howl mm -hmm. with in misery, with many different miseries. Mm -hmm. We should make sure that we do not profess to know God, right? And deny him by our ungodly use. Of not only wealth but finances mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. everything we do has to reflect Jesus Christ and his word mm -hmm. everything that we do I can tell you where your heart is if you show me your bank statement mm -hmm. I can tell you exactly where your heart is mm -hmm. if you just show me your bank statement mm -hmm. it doesn't you don't have to be a prophet for that mm -hmm. it's not a prophetic word Show me your bank statement, I'll tell you exactly where your heart is and what the issue is and what you should and should not do. It's that simple. It is. We don't want to be like these people that James is referring to. We don't want to hoard what we have, cheat people out of money, or to live a self-indulged life, only caring about ourselves and how much we can get and accumulate. Only being focused on ourselves, me, myself, and I. We don't want to hurt people in the process for the sake of gain. Riches that are hoarded, church, serve no purpose. They serve no purpose. God does not condemn wealth itself, again, but the greedy, selfish attitude towards accumulated more than what's needed. Right? These rich people had so much that it was rotting in storage. What good are these silos full of grain if when they go to get grain, it's all rotten and full of mold? Mold. What good are 10 changes of clothes if when you go to get something out of the closet, the moth's already eating it? God wants us to provide for our families and our own needs. Absolutely. But he condemns hoarding. Whether it's money, possessions, property, when it can be put to better use. You're not using it, give it to somebody. Right. You don't need it, give it to somebody. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? I'm not condemning saving. Saving is a good thing. You should save. I'm talking about hoarding. Mm -hmm. When you save, you have a goal. Save for your kid's college. You want to save for a car. You want to save for your house. Or your house needs repairs. You want to save. Absolutely, nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But when we're hoarding, we just keep adding and piling up. Adding a pie. You ever see that show, Hoarders? Mm -hmm. And we just keep accumulating just to have. Behind most of our hoarding, right, whether it's little or, or a lot, behind most of our hoarding is either the sin of greed 
or the lack of trust in God. Right? We don't trust that God can meet our needs. If that's the case, if we're hoarding like that. Don't spend your life, church, collecting junk that you never need or use. <laughs> Allow what you have to be used for the spreading of the gospel and the kingdom of God. Amen. That's all that matters. Where you spend eternity is what matters. Amen. And when you get there, you're accountable to God. God is going to ask you, what did you do with your daily wages? What did you do with what I blessed you with? Right? Did you give or help my people? Sometimes I think, man, what are the questions God's going to ask me? <laughs> right? I do. And the one thing that I, I shared this, I think, three weeks ago, the one thing that petrifies me is mishandling the Word of God, misinterpreting the Word of God, right? Inaccurately speaking, preaching, teaching the Word of God. That's the one thing that scares me to death. So when I'm acknowledged of something, I, I realize something, I have to address it. That's what's beautiful about the Word of God. If you're in the Word of God, He's constantly ministering to you. And you constantly notice what you should and should not be doing. Immediately. Right? God can speak to you every day. This week, like I said, has been one of the hardest weeks for my wife and I. Mentally. Right? But what kept us grounded? The word of God. Amen. You see, we could worship till we're blue in the face. You can fast pray. But if you do not have the word, you're not on solid ground. If you're not in the word, you're going to get knocked over. You're going to tumble quick. And I'm going to close with Jesus' story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus. Luke 16 Verses 19 through 31. I'm not going to read all of those verses. I'm just going to touch on it. The rich man lived in abundance, this rich man. Read the story when you get the chance. While Lazarus sat at this man's gate, covered with sores, waiting to be fed, not even a meal, with the crumbs that fell from this rich man's table. That's all, that's all he was waiting for. He didn't even want a meal. So long story short, after death, their roles were reversed. The rich man was now in agony, as Lazarus was when he had his sores. He was in agony because of the flames of hell, whereas Lazarus was now comfortably in Abraham's bosom. Read Luke 16, 19 to 31. The rich man asked Abraham, Abraham, can you send Lazarus only to dip his finger in water so that he can put it on my tongue and soothe my tongue from the flames of fire? Abraham said, nope. <laughs> Remember during your lifetime that you had everything you can ever want and then some. And Lazarus had nothing. Now, Lazarus is being comforted. But you are going to remain in anguish. The rich man's selfish indulgence and lack of compassion for the poor reflected his godless, selfish focus in life. Right? And he clearly was now paying the consequences of his lust and passion for wealth. That passion and desire that burned within him for wealth. Now he's paying the consequences. Now what can your wealth do? Amen. Nothing. You can't buy your way out of this one. Amen. No matter how much you give. So I end with this. Ephesians 2, chapter 8. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. I say that because salvation is by grace through Jesus Christ alone. Not our wealth. Not our accumulations. Not our money. Not what we have. What we have, it's a blessing, absolutely. Thank God for it. But it's nothing. 
Don't let it interfere with what matters. Money, wealth, all of these things, you can see the destructiveness behind the heart that is after that lusts and burns with fire for these things. You can see their lives. Just look at them. Look at the person that's constantly chasing after wealth. Constantly chasing after accumulations of things, property, whatever it may be, cars, houses, whatever the case is, whatever gains them wealth. Look at their lives. If they don't have the Lord, they're miserable. They're miserable. They can put on a good front. They're miserable. Right? Church, we have to examine ourselves. Examine our own lives through the word of God. So that we don't fall into what James is condemning in these six verses. I believe that the Lord wants us as believers to live simply. And to manage our resources in light of his eternal purposes. Live a simple life. My wife and I, we just live a simple life. Live a simple life. If you stop chasing after these things, you're going to see how much easier your life becomes. Right? More money. More problems. I don't want all those problems. I don't need them. I have enough. Be careful not to hurt innocent people in the process of trying to make a profit. It's dangerous ground. It's dangerous ground. This will destroy families. James was telling them that judgment day is near. In other words, all the wrongs are going to be made right. All the wrong that we do God will make right by justly judging everyone. Amen. Let's stand. No one is excluded from the judgment of God.